Good morning, everyone. My name is Mary Tingerthal. I'm commissioner at the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency, and I want to welcome you to our presentation of our uh, 2017 affordable housing plan. Uh, thank you for taking the time to be with us today. At Minnesota Housing, uh, last year we uh, updated our strategic plan and uh, restated our vision. And here you see it. Our vision is that all Minnesotans will live in a safe, stable home they can afford in a community of their choice. Our role in that, our mission, is that because housing is a foundation for success, we collaborate with individuals, communities, and partners, many of you who are on the phone today, to create, preserve, and finance affordable housing. Uh, so what we do with our uh, uh, affordable housing plan is work with all of you to make that a reality. Our strategic priorities, again, adopted last year. Some of them you'll see, for those of you who've been around for a while, are familiar, and others are a little bit uh, different than they've been in the past. The first one is really a focus uh, in our home ownership area on reducing Minnesota's uh, disparity around households uh, from different racial and ethnic groups that are much lower than um, uh, house, home ownership for whites. Uh, in Minnesota, uh, we have a fairly deep disparity, and we've really had some success the last couple of years really focusing our efforts and the efforts of realtors and lenders on serving uh, first-time home buyers of color. You'll hear more about that as we go through the presentation. Preventing and ending homelessness is uh, a repeat uh, theme here with our affordable housing plan. Uh, we uh, have adopted the uh, plan to prevent and end homelessness, and I serve as the co-chair along with uh, the commissioner of the Department of Human Services on an interagency council that focuses on these issues. The third is to preserve housing with federal project-based rent assistance. We have about 100,000 units of housing in Minnesota that are available with some form of rental assistance. And a lot of that housing is very old, uh, going back to the uh, mid-70s and mid-80s. And we found, since it was built very well in the beginning, that it's uh, a good public investment to invest dollars to preserve those federal rent assistance payments in that housing. The fourth is uh, to finance housing that's responsive to Minnesota's changing demographics. Uh, this covers uh, a number of areas, including the fact that uh, Minnesota is getting older and the fact that Minnesota is getting more diverse, and particularly the fact that uh, not only the metropolitan area is becoming more diverse, but also in uh, communities in greater Minnesota. And finally, uh, this is one we've seen before, uh, addressing specific and critical local housing needs. This really speaks to the fact that we've tried over the last several years especially to make sure that we're in tune with local communities as they define what the particular needs are in their area that might be very different from those in another part of the state. The purpose of our affordable housing plan is that it really serves as the agency's business plan. Uh, the starting date of the plan uh, will be uh, October 1st of this year. Uh, we set that as our start date because that allows us to align some of the federal resources that we have available in the plan. And also it gives us time after the end of a legislative session to incorporate any resources that we may have received during that year's legislative session. It summarizes the things that we're going to be focusing on. Uh, it covers uh, things that we've done for many years, but tries to highlight uh, the things that we will particularly be focusing on in the coming year. Uh, it continues to imp implement our strategic plan that we adopted last year. It does, for those of you who are into the details, uh, specifies program by program funding. And because we run so many of our programs uh, from year to year, you can see where we might be uh, shifting focus a little bit or where uh, market 
demands uh, that we uh, take a little different look at some of our program funding. Uh, we also talk about the number of units and households that will be assisted uh, by this plan uh, when it is fully implemented. Our strategic plan, from which I've just gone over the uh, strategic priorities, uh, housing is the foundation for success. What does that mean? Uh, as we work with our colleagues from other state agencies and local agencies, we really are understanding more and more fully that it's very tough for households that don't have stable housing to really focus on education, their health, or even getting a job. And uh, so we have collaborated with the Department of Education, Department of Health, and Department of Economic Development to really explore how we can focus uh, getting people stable in housing so that they can be successful in those other uh, parts of their lives. Secondly, we all articulate in the strategic plan that we're going to focus on those with greatest needs. That doesn't mean we'll discontinue our continuum of housing programs, but particularly where we have scarce uh, appropriated dollars, you'll see those dollars being uh, focused on those households that have really critical needs. And what are some of the cornerstones for the uh, foundations, or what are our principles as we implement that strategic plan? One is just to provide a lot of choices and access to opportunity for the people uh, that end up uh, moving into that housing. We try to provide a wide range of financing tools. As uh, new tools become available, we try to implement those tools very, very quickly. For example, in this year's affordable housing plan, you'll see that uh, we're including new dollars from the Federal Housing Trust Fund that's available for the very first time this year. Serving low and moderate income households across the spectrum, uh, as you go through a copy of the plan, you'll see that uh, the median income of people served by the various programs that we administer uh, range pretty broadly uh, across the spectrum, uh, depending on whether it's uh, very low income rental housing or uh, more of our home ownership options. And finally, I want to emphasize again, the engagement of local communities has really been a hallmark for us in the last several years. Uh, just yesterday, I was uh, up in Grand Rapids for the uh, ribbon cutting of a project that came out of a local housing institute uh, sponsored by the Minnesota Housing Partnership where people from uh, many different agencies and different disciplines came together around a 48-unit project uh, that in just one month uh, is completely filled and uh, will provide both needed supportive housing and housing for local families. It was really quite a heartwarming event, and we want to see more and more of those uh, projects opening that really have the support of the communities that they're located in and where communities are feeling that their local needs are being met. One of the things that we uh, find that we need to talk about, particularly with the legislature and with members of Congress, is that the need for affordable housing uh, sadly has not diminished despite our many efforts, and in fact, in some ways, is uh, growing over the last several years. The uh, numbers are really pretty startling. Over 600,000 households in Minnesota are cost burdened. That means that they are paying more than 30% of their incomes for their housing costs every month. That's almost a 70% increase in the number of cost burdened households since the year 2000, so just 16 years ago. And um, it's something that unfortunately is getting worse rather than better. And what lies behind that is the fact that incomes, after you adjust for inflation, so the purchasing power of Minnesotans has actually gone down by about 5.6% since 2000. At the same time, also adjusting for inflation, housing costs are up by eight, a little over 8%. 
So that means that gap is really growing. And so the struggle to provide housing that's affordable every year gets tougher for all of you who uh, try to uh, run these programs locally, develop housing. Uh, we know that uh, both of those pressures are uh, constantly in our minds. Housing costs, we are afraid, will continue to rise because of limited supply. The rental vacancy rate in most parts of Minnesota is uh, 3% or lower. And the supply of homes for sale, so that's existing uh, homes for sale, is around three to four months. And uh, that we're seeing that hit particularly hard in our first-time homebuyer programs this year, where the competition for houses that are, uh, say, below the $250,000 range are maybe down around two months supply and competition is intense. We also talked a little earlier about the disparities in home ownership and this graph shows it pretty uh, starkly. Uh, we're uh, a little over 70% as a state in home ownership which was very high. Uh, I think the third highest in the nation for home ownership. Uh, but that's tilted pretty heavily towards white homeowners uh, in Minnesota, where uh, it's over 76% of white households are homeowners, where you see at the other end of the spectrum uh, African-American households that uh, are less than 24% homeowners. So we really are working very strongly to close that gap uh, through our homeownership uh, initiatives, which you'll see in the plan. There are also big disparities in homelessness. So we've made some progress uh, since uh, uh, the Great Recession in reducing overall homelessness in the state. Uh, but on a share of population basis, uh, the share of homeless that are Hispanic, American Indian, and African American have actually gone up while the share of the homeless uh, that are white has gone down. So we're really uh, looking at um, closing those disparities as we move forward with our program. I'm now going to turn it over to John Patterson, our Director of Planning, Research, and Evaluation, uh, who is really uh, the person that drives the development of the Affordable Housing Plan, working with all of you and working with our staff here at Minnesota Housing to develop the plan. So we'll take just a short break while John is uh, taking over the microphone. Thank you, Mary. Again, this is John Patterson. I'm the Director of Planning, Research, and Evaluation at Minnesota Housing. And I'm going to go through sort of two other parts of the plan, sort of our approach and some of the resources we're making available this year. Um, as far as uh, the plan itself, um, you know, we've really decided that it's not just what we do, it's how we do it. And this plan really does a nice job of articulating that. And we have some five key principles that we're following. We leverage strong financial management. We develop effective partnerships. We're flexible and responsive. Um, we provide equitable access, and we are innovative and creative. And I'm going to go through each of these five points and provide a little more context and a couple examples of what is highlighted in the plan itself. As far as leveraging strong financial management, um, we have limited resources and great needs, as Mary had highlighted, and we want to get the most out of those resources. Unfortunately, we have a strong balance sheet of assets that are capable of producing earnings and some agency-generated um, resources. And we can use these very strategically. And I think the best example of that is the Habitat for Humanity initiative that we're just sort of launching right now. And through 2020, we plan to give $20 million, $10 million to this initiative with 2.5 this year. And that will serve as seed capital uh, for Habitat to hopefully um, get about $75 million for an investment pool, which will serve about 400 new home buyers. And this will really reflect Minnesota's increasingly diverse population. That's a great example of how we're using our resources um, to leverage other resources and have the greatest impact possible. In the area of developing effective partnerships, um, as Mary sort of highlighted, we really operate through partnerships. We have lenders, developers, community-based organizations, a lot of you on this call. 
really make our programs work. And to do that well, we have to strengthen that partnership network. This year, we're going to really focus on working with organizations that connect with and serve specific cultural and ethnic groups, and also looking at strengthening organizations that serve our broad needs in large areas, often rural, and have limited resources, and making sure that those organizations have the capacity to operate effectively. Um, we try to be reflect, uh, flexible, responsive. Uh, we live in a very dynamic world right now, coming out of the Great Recession, the housing crisis, um, the economy and the housing market have changed dramatically. We're much more diverse than we were in the past, um, and uh, we need to respond to those and, and be responsive very quickly. A couple examples. Um, just in the last year, housing prices have increased considerably with that limited supply, and a lot of sellers aren't willing to pay the closing costs anymore. So buyers come to the table and need a lot more cash to close. And so we increase the maximum deferred payment loan from $5,500 to $7,500. Another example is um, our uh, RRDL, our Rental Rehabilitation Deferred Loan Program. Um, and we have made the loans going to properties with one to four units forgivable. Doing evaluation of the program, we saw that about 50% of the rental housing stock in greater Minnesota are those one to four unit buildings, but it's only accounting for like five to 10% of our program dollars. And so we really want to encourage rehabilitation of those smaller developments, and so we made those loans forgivable. Coming this year, we're going to make an effort to uh, make our qualified allocation plan for tax credit simpler. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with a qualified allocation plan, it is the plan we use to allocate the tax credits um, to developments across the state and really identifies our priorities and the selection criteria. Um, it's a, uh, we try to do a lot with it, and I think it's time for us to take a step back and really think about how do we make it as simple as possible so that our goals and objectives are as clear as possible and um, developers can follow the plan as closely as possible. We want to provide equitable access. Um, uh, as Mary stated, our, our, our vision really is to provide Minnesotans with stable, affordable housing in the community of their choice and really look at those disparities that were highlighted. Um, we've done some great work in the last year. Just last year, we increased that Minnesota housing, our lending to houses of color by 69%. That went from 674 to 1,141 first-time home buyers. It's a dramatic increase, and it was with the work of our staff and our partners out there who did a great job in increasing that, that amount of lending. Um, we're also in the process right now of running a pilot program that provides rent assistance um, and uh, stable housing to homeless and highly mobile students. Um, and in the initial two years of the program, over 90% of the students receiving that assistance in their families are houses of color. And we'll also be implementing our Olmstead plan. That's our statewide plan to um, give people with disabilities opportunities and choices to live and work in the community settings of their choice and in um, integrated communities and not in institutional or segregated settings. Um, to deal with the barriers um, that people face for housing, we really have to be innovative and creative. We have to go beyond the sticks and bricks of actual housing and think about strategies to remove barriers that people face for housing. Um, some of the urgent needs are people with um, criminal records or evictions really have a tough time finding housing. So we'll continue to provide guidance to landlords that we have um, properly financed on, on the tenant selection criteria. And this year, the legislature gave us $250,000 to work on a pilot for a landlord risk mitigation fund that will allow um, landlords access funds for potential costs that are greater than a security deposit to give the incentive to rent these um, harder to house populations. Next, I want to sort of go through the resources that are available. You know, we talk about how we uh, do our work. This is really the, 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 those dollars we have to carry out that work. Um, I want to give you a, a little bit of a, of a heads up on how you can sort of look at the plan itself and look at these resources. Chapters one and two of the plan talk about the need and the approach, which we just talked about. I'm jumping into um, an overview of chapter three, the resources for our work. Um, and in the plan itself, you can get some, see some tables that go into the 40-some programs we have. Um, I'm providing this webinar is just an overview. But if you really want to get into the details of it, you can go to Appendix B of the plan. Um, there's usually a one to two page description of all 40 of our programs, including the funding sources. Um, and you can see how those programs operate and how they fit together. And Appendix A gets into some of the funding sources we have um, and how different funding sources we have are allocated to specific programs. But back to Chapter 3 and the resources for our work, and I'm going to provide now just a general overview. Um, our 40 some programs fall into some broad categories, and this table just shows the funding level we originally budgeted last year and this year, 
Um, just going down the list here, we have home buyer financing and home refinancing. That's just mortgages for buying a home or refinancing with some additional assistance. It could be a, uh, a down payment closing cost loans. Um, some of our work with Habitat follows in this category of financing some mortgages. We have home buyer uh, and owner education. These are classes and coaching and counseling for home buyers or people possibly facing foreclosure. We have home improvement loans. These are loans just to maintain your house. Uh, we have rental production. Um, this is loans and amortizing loans and deferred loans and housing tax credits for new construction rehabilitation. Next, we have rental assistance contract administration. Um, Mary talked about the project-based Section 8 programs in Minnesota, and uh, we're under contract with HUD to administer those contracts and um, send out the, the rent assistance. We have uh, preventing ending homelessness dollars. There's a lot of rent assistance that's state resources and some homeless prevention dollars. Uh, the rental portfolio management is some funds set aside um, for more emergency type um, activities or for properties in our portfolio. And last, we have um, the broad category, multiple use resources. So I'll give you an idea of the types of programs that we have. Um, and if you look at it, you can see at the top line um, that there's over $600,000 for home mortgages. Um, those are you know, often $150,000, $160,000 mortgages and that people are paying, uh, paying back. Another big uh, uh, category is the Rental Assistance Contract Administration. That's the second biggest category. That's annual assistance. It's um, rent assistance grants for people um, to make their housing more affordable and often on a household basis it's about uh, $6,000 to $9,000. Just give you an idea of the broad categories. Um, if you look at the bottom line, um, at, down at the bottom, it shows that we were just under a billion dollars last year. And this year we're going to have a little over a billion dollars of activity, which is great. Um, it's a lot of resources, but unfortunately, it's not quite meeting the need, but we need to use those resources as efficiently as possible. As you can see, I have the stars on the side there. I'm going to jump into those categories a little bit, bit to talk about the changes. Home mortgages saw a big increase, and um, we potentially had a, a pretty big decrease in some of our rental production um, with the fact that um, housing infrastructure bonds were not included in uh, this year's legislative activity, but we've made some steps to try to mitigate the impact of that um, lack of um, bonding dollars. And again, the next uh, table is going to jump into the details. Um, so these are specific programs in those categories of the um, that I had in the previous slide. Um, for home mortgages, um, we went from about, we budgeted last year about $510 million and um, this year we're going to hit um, maybe $590 million. And um, for 2017 we should hit about a similar amount. Um, the next line, uh, housing infrastructure bonds. Uh, last year we had about $20 million, $10 million of new, million of new money, and 10 of some leftover money. This year we have about $4.5 million uh, still left over. That's a, a, almost a $16 million reduction. And we try to think as creative as possible. How can we fill that gap? And as mentioned earlier by Mary, the National Housing Trust Fund first became available. There's $3 million there. Um, we looked at our Economic Development Housing Challenge Program, some of our uh, flexible money on rental production, and we decided to forward allocate some money um, a little bit earlier than we would have otherwise to help fill that gap. And lastly, um, we have some flexible dollars, our pool three dollars. That's agency-generated revenues um, that we've gained over the years that we can give out as grants and deferred loans, and we decided to expand that much, that, that amount a little bit to try to mitigate the size of that reduction. So overall, we have about a um, 80, 75, $76 million increase in, in, in funding for the year, um, which is uh, good to see given all the affordable housing needs that we have. When you look at households, um, this is those same broad categories I showed with the funding levels, the households assisted. Um, you can see that the Rental Assistance Contract Administration is the most households. It's 30,000 households receiving Section 8 contracts. Um, some of the other big categories are the um, home mortgages. Even though we have over $600 million going to home mortgages, that assists about uh, almost 4,000 households um, with some mortgages that need to be paid back. Also with home buyer education and um, homeless prevention dollars, there's some large number of households being assisted. Bottom line, we're going to assist nearly 65,000 households um, this year, um, which is a, a great number, but again, uh, a, not coming near the amount of uh, resource that we need to meet the 600,000 cost burden households. 
just briefly want to leave my contact information on the slide. Um, if you happen to miss this, this webinar will be posted on the um, internet. Um, and um, you can get my contact information there also. But if you have questions about the plan, um, feel free to contact me directly. Um, we're going to move on to the comments and Q&A and just talk about quickly about the public comment period. Um, we issued the plan uh, last week. Um, we go from today. We'll run through next Thursday. Um, you can send public comments um, through, 4, through 4.30 um, next Thursday. Send them to mn.housing at state.mn.us. And if you've not seen the plan itself, you can go to our website. And I have the URL up there. And in the lower left ho left hand corner of our home page, there's a special announcement section. And there'll be a link to the plan itself so you can see the full plan. And again, a little more details about, about the plan itself and how to, how to comment. Formal comments are, are great. And just the process is that we get those comments. We summarize them. Uh, along with all the full comments, we give them to our board of directors for further discussion. And um, in many cases, we will go back and actually revise the plan. Um, based on comments if uh, it's consistent with the, the data and information that we're seeing. So your input is critical for an effective plan. And so we, I strongly encourage everyone to comment. And we really uh, want to thank you for taking time out of your busy days today to spend an hour with us uh, reviewing the plan. We encourage you to read the plan as a whole. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty quick read. as. And then for those of you who like the details, the appendices give you a lot of detail. So uh, we encourage you to read it, give us your feedback, and we'll be bringing this to our, uh, our board in September for adoption. So thanks, and uh, we look forward to hearing your comments.